Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Venom Vlog. Episode 700, we are finally here and right around the fourth anniversary of this show. I missed it by a couple days, I think, but I've just had a lot of crazy stuff going on lately with uh, just health and, and work and stuff. Um, and so, and I was just getting tired, you know, coming home from work and yeah, so uh, you know, my fatigue level has been, it's been a tough battle uh, this past like two weeks with it, but I'm doing okay now and I want to get this video done to you guys because we've been talking about it for a while and I had a vote and all of you voted for episode 700 to focus on the alien costume saga when Spider-Man had the black costume. So that's what we're going to do in today's episode. We're going to break down the overall, like the main two trade paperbacks of the alien costume trade paperbacks. Like those are released in volume one and two. I'll have the images up there. Those are what's currently available that captures that whole time period in two volumes. So that's mainly going to be the bulk of what we talk about today, but we're also going to talk about a couple of appearances that Spider-Man made in the black costume. We might talk a little bit about at the end of this episode, we'll talk about what Peter David's doing, but I want to save, because uh, we've already covered some of the Peter David stuff that's been recently coming out that kind of flashes back to the time Peter had the costume. We will talk about like those in brief, you know, uh, chunks at the end of this, and I will give whole videos dedicated to Crossroads and the King in Black symbiote Spider-Man story um, and Alien Reality. We'll do whole videos on those, so those won't be included here. This will just be the original arc of the black costume, and then we'll mention a little bit about other times Peter wore the black costume, even though it wasn't the alien costume. He wore like a, a suit that Black Cat made for him that was the black costume uh, that she stitched together. So we'll talk a little bit about that towards the end. We'll also talk about the animated version of it because we did whole episodes on that as well, but we never talked about the comic book adaptation. So I'll mention that here in this episode. And then we also got a couple, like two little stories, uh, like single issue stories that have the alien costume, one without Peter Parker in it and one with him along with some of my other favorite uh, characters in the, you know, the realm of fiction, which is the Transformers. So this is going to be a, a, a packed episode. I'm going to try to get through it as fast as I can, but it'll probably be around, you know, the 45 to one hour uh, marker. So buckle in, uh, you know, if you want to watch and come back to this throughout the day or, you know, while you're driving or coming home from work, whatever it is, this will be a long one and uh, it'll be a mixture of seeing my face and then also maybe just some voiceover stuff. So I'm going to try to piece all this together and get it out to you as soon as possible. So hopefully it comes together well. And if you like it at the end, give us a like and, uh, and leave your thoughts down below of what you think of everything that we cover in this episode. So without further ado, let's dive into this amazing saga because we have a lot to cover. So the place that we're obviously going to start is the original. So this series or this you know storyline ran across a number of Spider-Man books and Marvel team-up book, uh, which starred Spider-Man at the time as it was nearing the end of its run around issue 150. So those last like eight issues or whatever, and then we have Amazing Spider-Man, we have Peter Parker Spider-Man, and then they even launched the web of Spider-Man with number one, and that's where the alien costume comes back to join with Peter Parker, and that's where we get the great scene at the church and stuff with the bells and everything where Peter separates himself from the suit. So there's a lot to cover here. I'm going to have all the issues you know, listed right there. Those are all the issues that we're going to be talking about. Some of them I'll go into detail about. Some of them I won't. Things I might just graze over as generalizations. Um, so I'm just going to kind of go off the cuff here. I didn't really script anything, but I have some images on screen to kind of remind me of certain beats and stories and stuff and issues that uh, that I might focus on. So at this time, let me just set the stage here. Secret Wars is where this really all began. And so we'll start there with just a couple images that are, you know, uh, reprinted in the first trade paperback of the Alien Costume Saga. There was a story called Secret Wars in the 80s where this being called the Beyonder showed up and he had all this power and he wanted to know what was really more powerful, good or evil. And so he picked some villains, he picked some heroes uh, from Earth randomly and brought them to another world, you know, battle world, and had them fight each other to see who would win. Uh, there was both the comic book version of this and then later on in the 90s Spider-Man cartoon, they, are, they did an animated version of it, which, uh, which had some cool characters. I love that Spider-Man chose Storm in the animated one because he got to pick the people that went with him. And he said, you know, there's a girl who could control weather on the X-Men. I think she would be a, a great ally to have. So let's bring her, which was really cool. Um, so, yeah, so there, there's been you know, animated adaptations of this. There's been other comics, Secret Wars 2 and everything. But the original Secret Wars had a scene where Spider-Man's costume got ripped in battle. He goes back to their high, you know, like, I guess their resting area. They were given like a, an area where they can rest. And Thor and uh, some other characters had their suits, Hulk and stuff, had their clothes 
you know, healed up or like restitched uh, using some technology from uh, one of the devices that the Beyonder created. So they're like, oh yeah, in the room over there, you can fix your costume. And Spider-Man's like, great. So he goes in there to fix his costume. And of course, Peter Parker goes to the wrong machine because obviously Parker luck, he's not, you know, it always happens to him. He goes over to a machine, sees some ooze in there, uh, goes and presses a button and the ooze releases and bonds with him. And he doesn't know it's bonding because he doesn't know it's a symbiote. He just thinks it's like some kind of synthetic cloth. But unlike everyone else who just had their regular costume stitch up and they look like their normal selves, he now is covered in black and he doesn't know why, but he's like, whatever, I'm, you know, I'm not going to look a gift horse in the mouth, whatever, this is cool. Maybe I can be more stealthy with this. And he's like, so I'll go with it for now. And then he completes the Secret Wars saga in that costume. And the main reason he got involved in the Secret Wars, his friend was there, uh, Dr. Kirk Connors, who was the lizard. So when Dr. Kirk Connors turns back into Kirk Connors from the lizard, Spider-Man is like, okay, I got to save this guy. Like, this is one of the reasons I stuck around. I have a friend here that I want to help. So when the portal opens at the end of Secret Wars, after the good guys win, to go back to Earth, Spider-Man grabs Kirk Connors and jumps through, um, you know, to make sure he's safe and bring him back to his family. So, and in this funny thing is, is that moment where they come through the portal together, that is reprinted or retold in like three of these comics because all of these are supposed to take place around the same time. Uh, it's kind of a mess. There's a point where like Spider-Man shows up in Amazing Spider-Man and he's bringing Kirk Connors back and he's like, okay, here you are. But then there's a scene like in Marvel Team Up where Spider-Man comes back and then he immediately goes and teams up with uh, Daredevil and Black Widow. So there's, there's some continuity things. It was probably a lot of hard work to get all this stuff together. But technically, uh, Spider-Man didn't, leave the secret wars because the secret wars was like running late or got delayed so actually one of the spider-man comics came out first uh, and that was the first time we saw spider-man in the black costume and for like a month people were like i don't understand like why does he have a black costume and uh, and it's like oh we have to go read secret wars to find out and that story will wrap up soon you know so it, there was again some release and scheduling issues but overall you know this these two trades put everything in order and what's great is like you know now you can see it in in the order it was meant to be even if there is some contradictions like the you know the moment he comes back but it's fine it's it's not that big of a deal little nitpicky stuff some of it uh, but really what it is is now spider-man is back on earth in this black costume <laughs> Where did that black costume come from? Did Marvel just come up with the idea? Uh, no, actually there was a gentleman named Randy Schuler who actually created this idea. He was a fan, he wrote in, he said, you know, it'd be really cool if you guys changed Spider-Man's costume, even for a little while, I was thinking something like this. And he drew like a, a black costume with a red spider on it. And Marvel was into that. You know, the editors at the time were like, hey, you know what, this is pretty cool. We like this look, we may use a variation of it. Um, do you mind if we pay you like, I think they paid him like 200 and something dollars. They were like, would you like to have some money and, you know, just for giving us the idea? And Randy was like, sure. And so Marvel paid him and then went and made the black costume. And they changed the red to white, obviously. And that's how we got this character. So there is a Randy Schuler written Spider-Man book after all these years, you know, because that guy, he just got 200 and whatever, 20 bucks or something like that. He didn't make a lot of money. And look how popular the black costume is and then Venom coming from that, like, that guy should have got probably a lot more money. I don't know. Maybe he did. I don't know the behind the scenes stuff. Maybe Marvel, you know, gave him something later on or whatever. But what they did do is they let him write a solo black costume Spider-Man story, like his version of it, I guess. And that is available out there. I'll put the cover up there and we will do an episode on that at some point in the future. But I just want to at least mention that in this episode that it exists because we never covered it yet. And I wanted to do this episode before we did. So that episode will be coming up at some point in the near future. So, uh, so yeah, so Randy created this suit gave it to Marvel. They wanted to use it. Originally, they had an idea for a synthetic suit for Iron Fist, I guess. And then those ideas changed and they got this drawing and they said, let's put it on Spider-Man. Uh, that's, I think that'll be a more fun character to do it with. And I think they were right. But here's where the storyline kind of caught me off guard. So when I think of the Alien Costume Saga, I think of the animated series. I think, so I've read these books, obviously, but the animated series was so well done with the costume and how it like brought out Peter Parker's anger and rage and it didn't like being stepped on and it had him push back against bullies like Flash Thompson and stuff. And it made him, you know, he had an attitude and he would snap at people. And they also used that a little bit in the movie, the live action Tobey Maguire movie. I guess that it, that was so such a well addition um, done so greatly, you know, that I think of that as the definitive version. So when I was rereading this, I was really blown away 
that the costume didn't really try to alter Peter Parker's mood at all. Honestly, I was blown away by that. Uh, like, I think, so all these years and all this time doing this show, I was thinking, okay, the suit hates Spider-Man because it rejected him, but didn't it, like, you know, manipulate Spider-Man and, and, and get him to do things he didn't want to do? Not really. Really what the suit did, the only egregious thing the suit did, uh, which is which is bad, but not, like, as bad as affecting Peter Parker's temper and getting him to lash out against his loved ones, that's obviously has impact, a major impact on Peter Parker. In the comics, the suit, all it did was it just took Peter Parker out for nightly strolls. <laughs> there was that one Spider-Man annual, I think, that Saladin Ahmed wrote, and we covered it on the show, I think, along with uh, episode four, or uh, volume four, issue four, of uh, First Host. I think I squeezed it in at the end. There was a short story that came out that was set during this time period where it was Spider-Man, you know, falling asleep, and then the suit... Uh, goes out at night and fights crime and it fights the uh, I think it's a uh, hammerhead it fights and it gets involved with the black cat and so it was kind of adding on to this you know time period like uh, adding a little story but it didn't really add too much and, and we've seen that a hundred times in this where Spider-Man just gets taken around you know uh, while he's asleep and so I didn't think it add anything extra but then when I look at this I'm like oh well I guess that makes sense now I you know I, I kind of um take you know going a few steps back on my my uh, breakdown or review of that issue because that's all it was like I, I was just blown away I was like wow I thought there was emotion involved and stuff and it, it's truly when the suit the reason it knows anger is because of Peter Parker Peter Parker reject rejects the suit and that teaches the suit those emotions you know so I just was like uh blown away by that I don't know there was a part of me that always thought that it it hurt Peter Parker through making him hurt his loved ones but that's just because the animated series did it so effectively and then the the Tobey Maguire movie built off that uh concept that it, that I thought that was just the true concept so when I was rereading this I was blown away all these years talking about the alien costume and the relationship with Peter I was blown away to just read this and go wow all it did really was wait for him to go to sleep and then it would you know borrow his body and swing around town with it like that's pretty crazy, and it would keep him asleep. So again, that's egregious, and that's that's not a great thing to do because it's basically doing things uh, to Peter against his will. And he would he it did affect his relationships in a way that he was always tired. He was like, man, I feel like I've been swinging all night, or I feel like the rhino punched me, or whatever. And it turns out all that stuff was happening. So anyway, I just want to go on a side tangent there because I was just blown away that that was all really that the suit did um, to Peter was that it just wore him out and uh, and it used him at times. Um, to go out and, and continue his work as Spider-Man. It wasn't like he was going out there and trying to really hurt people too much. It was just going out there because that's what Peter Parker did. And it was like, hey, I like doing this and he's asleep and I want to keep doing it. So some nights it would go out uh, with Peter. And then in some of the recent stories, uh, you know, the Peter David stuff and the Solid and Ahmed one, it would go out without Peter, you know, and then come back to him. So I don't know. I just thought that was interesting. And that some of you are probably going to be like, yeah, no duh, idiot. <laughs> but, you know, keep trying to keep all this in my head sometimes is not easy. And uh, I just thought it was there was more to it than that. But uh, but there wasn't. So uh, I found that neat, neat and interesting. So as you know, you go through this, we have the story where you know, he has the black suit and Amazing Spider-Man, he comes back, he sees the two kids arguing in the alley, like the couple, and he goes and takes them on top of a building and, you know, tells them like, you know, they should appreciate each other more and, you know, blah, 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 kind of gives them a little spiel. And then he swings out like, now I'm back, the Amazing Spider-Man. And obviously a lot of this we went over in the Chillers stories, which uh, I'll have the part three coming up soon too, now that we've done this episode. Um, so we've been breaking down, there was a junior novel kind of thing in the 90s but printed like a comic book that was called chillers and it was like a 90 page version of this story and i've been doing like a a read along of it and so i have those first two episodes i'll put down below if you want to check it out that'll be more in depth of some of the beats in the story and then i'll have part three up very very soon and then maybe i'll come back and add part three down there for those of you who are watching this you know after i record part three so uh so yeah you have spider-man doing that and then you immediately have him teaming up with people so in marvel team up you have him with Spider-Man, uh, Spider-Man teaming up with Daredevil and Black Widow. And the weird thing is the Spider-Man's barely in this issue. Like, it's him coming back, you know, with Kirk Connors. And then Daredevil's working a story or a case. And then uh, he's, like, you know, representing someone as a lawyer who he kind of makes a deal with the Kingpin, you know, to kind of get him, 
you know, found innocent. And that was basically, I guess, so Daredevil can go beat him up later. That's kind of like the Ben Affleck movie, where if someone was found guilty, he's like, all right, you're, or found innocent. He's like, all right, I know you're guilty, but you're found innocent. And you're going to go on the streets now. And now you're, you know, you're not my problem anymore. Is Matt Murdock, your Daredevil's problem. So it was a little bit of that. But Spider-Man calls, you know, Daredevil out on that. He's like, hey, that's not the right thing to do. You kind of got in bed with the Kingpin a little bit to make this happen. And that's not the Daredevil I know. And Black Widow's like, eh, screw him. Screw, screw Spider-Man. Like, you know, sometimes you got to play in the gray area. And Daredevil is not sure if he, if she's right about that. He's like, well, maybe not. Maybe having high morals is not a bad thing. So I kind of like that. That was great. So again, it's not the suit negatively having an impact on Peter's friends. Uh, it's, it's Peter still doing heroic things while we're in the black suit. The main thing that's going on around this time is actually Black Cat and Peter Parker or Spider-Man have a relationship. So Peter and Mary Jane have broken up and they haven't really been talking to each other too much. And uh, Peter's also uh, having disagreements with his Aunt May. He told Aunt May that he's dropping out of grad school so he can be a full-time photographer, and she does not like that because it's going to affect his future. Um, so I, I loved all that. All that drama is really, really great and really well done. And then Black Cat, who is kind of more in love with Spider-Man and doesn't really find Peter Parker that attractive, but she still likes Spider-Man, and so she's kind of uh, you know, been flirting with Spider-Man and now they're kind of dating, but as superheroes, you know, um, but Black Cat does have a secret. She went to Kingpin, you know, Spider-Man doesn't like people who make deals with Kingpin, but Black Cat around this time or right before this lost her powers. Like she had some powers and then she went, she just became like a normal cat burglar. So she went to Kingpin and he used some, you know, uh, villain trickery and uh, magic and stuff like he was looking into to try to, you know, um, you know, help his own situation to, to be more, you know, rich and all this other stuff. And he found this uh, totem, I think, or something to give Black Cat her bad luck powers back. So that's what's going on. So anyone around Black Cat just at this point is starting to have bad luck. That's when she wants to use her powers. But she doesn't activate them or they don't activate around Peter because she she loves Spider-Man. So, uh, so that was another a, a neat addition around this time that Peter is not dating Mary Jane or Gwen Stacy. He's He actually is dating another person with powers and who runs around at night in their uh, pajamas like he does so uh, so the black cat relationship is really well done here hobgoblin is uh you know stealing stuff from oscorp you know norman osborne obviously is dead at this point in the comics but harry isn't um but harry is trying to figure out who this goblin is and also harry is maybe secretly a goblin as well you know he or is building up to that um and then also in this series we get to see normie his son uh, be born so liz allen is actually in this book uh, in the hospital for most of it and it's her being pregnant with normie and then at the end normie is born so there's a lot of big moments and big uh, spider-man moments uh, and characters in this even flash thompson he's going through some harsh stuff and he's dating a girl but then he loses interest in her because he thinks she's seeing Peter Parker, even though his girlfriend is just going to Peter Parker for advice on, you know, what's going on with Flash because he's hiding a secret. And uh, and then he turns out he's trying to play football again. He's trying to relive his glory days. And that brings him back across the path of Betty Brant. So he starts dating Betty Brant again uh, and breaks up with that other girl. But he not really, he's not really that clean about it. Like he's kind of like, oh, okay, she's that girl clearly doesn't love me anymore so now I'm just going to go date Betty Brandt and really it was just a, a non-communication thing that girl still wanted to be with uh with Flash but he was he already moved on to Betty and so it was kind of a scummy thing there's not, not a lot of communication there but um but you know typical for Flash and he does try to rectify the situation later but in this story they don't they don't really get to that so there's just a lot of big character moments in this there's this villain that shows up called the Answer who's like a total goofball uh that is hired by um by, by the Kingpin to go to kind of mess with the relationship between Black Cat and Spider-Man. Kingpin learns that Black Cat has a love, you know, is in love with Spider-Man and that they're together. Um, so he's like, okay, I don't know who Spider-Man is. I don't have, know his secret identity, but, uh, but I'm going to still manipulate Black Cat so we could hurt Spider-Man and get him off his game, you know, and that's kind of what he thinks he's doing. But when Peter goes to sleep, he is off his game a little bit, but when he goes to sleep, the suit is still taking him out there and still stopping crime. And Kingpin's like, I don't understand. I thought, I thought we're messing with him mentally, but the suit is out there actively stopping some of these crimes that are inadvertently affecting Kingpin's work. So it's making him more, you know, getting more aggressive. And he's like, no, we got to shut this down. We got to keep Spider-Man distracted and out of our way. So he brings in this guy named The Answer to help out. 
Um, but then also like Jason McIndale, my favorite Hobgoblin, he shows up as Jack-O-Lantern because he was Jack-O-Lantern at this time. So there's part of that. There's a, a team up with Spider-Man and Captain Marvel, uh, but it's the Monica Rambeau Captain Marvel, who I really like. Uh, she is in this and she teams up with Star Fox, uh, Thanos' brother, um, and the two of them team up with Spider-Man and she starts losing control of her powers. So Spider-Man and Star Fox go to another planet to um, deactivate something that so that she can control her powers again. Something's going on on this other planet and it's affecting Monica Rambeau somehow. So uh, Spider-Man and Star Fox go off and, and stop it. So that was kind of neat because Star Fox was a little bit of a newish character around this time and a new new member of the Avengers. So he's kind of the rookie of the team. And, and like I said, he's Thanos' brother, and he's kind of a, a, a pig, a little bit of a, a male chauvinistic pig at times. So Spider-Man teaming up with someone like that was just kind of interesting and, and kind of fun. There's some cool Puma stories in here. Uh, I think they even introduced Puma during this time. And like I said, Cloak and Dagger plays a big part, and Cloak and Dagger are actually um, one of a Cloak is, uh, or Dagger actually, she's uh, weakened at some point, and she's captured. And they lure, they use her to lure Cloak in, and Kingpin captures Cloak. And then he starts, he realizes that Cloak has the ability to bring people to other dimensions through his Cloak, right? Like that's his power. And so he says, all right, we'll release Dagger if you let us basically operate on you and figure out your powers. And so Cloak kind of begrudgingly goes along with it until it, it really turns on him and he's getting, he's forced down against his will and they activate a, a device that taps into the dimension that his cloak taps into. And by using that technology, they have this doctor named like Dr. On or Dr. Ohm or something like that. Uh, he becomes the spot. Uh, so he's this character. So we get the introduction of the spot, which is, I love that character. And I loved him in the animated series, but we have this character now who is using um, Cloak's cloak uh, to open these little portals. And what ends up happening is he gets sucked into one and all the portals latch onto him. And then he comes back out of the main portal in an all white suit covered in polka dots. And those polka dots, literally he puts his hand in and it goes into that dimension that Cloak is from or, or sends people to. So really, really neat. There's a lot of cool stories in here. A lot of new characters, like I said, Puma, the spot. Um, and then you have the transition. I think this is the transition from uh, Jason McIndale from you know, Jack Lantern to the Hobgoblin, but they don't really reveal in this, at least who this Hobgoblin is. Uh, obviously there's been different speculations. I think this is like, you know, people thought it could be Ned Leeds at one point earlier in the comics. And then now, you know, is this Robert Kingsley back or whatever? So this is starting to do that transition of the new Hobgoblin and how he's taking stuff from Oscorp and, and Harry. And that obviously angers Harry and gets him to want to get more involved with that side of his father's, you know, uh, life and becoming the new Green Goblin himself one day. So just a lot of big moments. Like I said, just this this book is full of big moments. A lot of cool team ups in here. Spider Man teams up with Alpha Flight um, because they need to protect or save Marina, who is captured by these villains. Uh, one of the villains, I think he's from the Alpha Flight comic books. Um, so there's a great team up with Spider Man and the Alpha Flight. Um, you get you get the conclusion to the answer story. Uh, Black Cat you know, fights against uh, the answer and then fights against Kingpin, uh, forcing a, a confrontation between Spider-Man and Kingpin to where Spider-Man shows up in the black costume and says, look, like, I don't want you messing with, you know, uh, Black Cat anymore. Uh, you need to stay out of her life. I found out about her. I found out about her. She, you know, comes clean with Spider-Man and tells her I got my powers back. Uh, you know, or she fights it at first. She's like, I don't want to, I don't want to. But eventually she gives in and Peter finds out that She's been hiding the secret and that her powers came from Kingpin. So Spider-Man goes and basically threatens Kingpin, fights him and says, look, and beats him kind of and says, look, if you come back for Black Hat, uh, I'll come back and shut you down for good. And so he's like, OK, fine, I, I will leave Black Cat alone. It doesn't matter what I was trying to do to you didn't work anyway. He's like, so fine, you won this round, Spider-Man, you know, get out of my hair, basically. So uh, so he kind of, um, you know, releases Black Cat from her deal with him, I guess, or whatever. But she still has her powers, her bad luck powers. So uh, so that storyline kind of gets wrapped up here. There's a Spider-Man team up with Iron Man in this, where, again, Spider-Man's in a black costume. And then, of course, we got Puma. So there's some cool Puma moments. And Puma beats the crap out of Spider-Man. He kind of shows up like a Craven the Hunter type and beats the crap out of Spider-Man. Uh, but the this first major section of the saga ends where spider-man it's like a dream like a, you know the dream sequence they recreated it in the animated series too they did a great job but this famous cover here where the two suits are pulling peter parker it's such a great moment in this one you have peter talking to mary jane he's kind of broke up a black cat they're 
friendship, his Mary Jane's friendship is a little bit on the out still. Uh, she learns that uh, Peter is, is, has been hooking up with Black Cat, even though that relationship is starting to fall apart as well. And then she also is trying to tell, talk Peter, you know, talk some sense into Peter, telling him to go see his Aunt May. And she's like, go see Aunt May. She loves you and she's really upset right now and, and you keep avoiding her calls. And he's like, I'm trying to talk to her, but, you know, about school and everything. But, she, you know, she's not answering my calls or sometimes or when I call and talk to her friend, the guy in the wheelchair, like uh, who's a friend of Aunt May's at this point in the comics. He's like, you know, she won't answer the phone. And he's like, so I'm trying. He goes, but, you know, she's mad at me for, for giving up on school. And he goes, but I want to have a full time career. I feel like I can make more money taking pictures of Spider-Man, you know, and now that he has this new suit, it, the, the, you know, the, the newspapers are selling and I'm, I'm getting a raise and stuff as long as I don't show up too tired, you know, and actually get the job done. So just the, all the drama for Peter Parker's life in, in full here uh, and done really, really well, I feel. I think that was some of my favorite stuff in this was the relationships between the characters. And it was surprising, like I said, because I thought he was going to be pushing these people away because the suit was making him uh, be more aggressive. But that's not the case. Like it's just standard Peter Parker, um, and and he's and at, he's pushing people away for different reasons. You know, he's finding out that Black Cat had secrets. Uh, him and Mary Jane, you know, are were already broke up. So trying to hang out with your ex sometimes is not easy. And then she's trying to talk to talk to him about his aunt, and that relationship is falling apart. And then Peter's showing up to work tired, so that relationship is falling apart at times because they're like, "Why are you late? Why are you so lazy? What's going on, Peter? You're not taking pictures. Like, what's happening?" So all these things are falling apart, but it's like some of the suits responsible for some of it, you know, uh, but not for everything. And I just was surprised by that, but I thought all that stuff was really well done. So this issue where Spider-Man realizes he goes to the Fantastic Four and he says, you know, I've been really sleepy lately. Everything's going on. I'm, I'm so tired. Uh, you know, can you test this suit? I got it on uh, Battle World when we were doing the Secret Wars. So, you know, Mr. Fantastic, can you scan it? So him and, you know, Human Torture there. The thing is not in the Fantastic Four at this point in the comics. He stayed behind on uh, on that world, you know, or, or he stayed behind in space, I think, and didn't rejoin the, uh, the Fantastic Four. So they have She-Hulk on the team. And then also around this time, uh, Sue Storm, I think this is during the John Byrne era, Sue Storm, uh, you know, Visible Woman, she had lost a child during childbirth. And so, uh, so that actually pops up. There's an issue where Spider-Man is teaming up with the Human Torch, and he tells that to Johnny. Like he's Johnny has been hypnotized, and so Spider-Man's like, maybe if I make him angry, he'll like snap out of it. And so, what does he do? He says, you know, I'm. He's like, of course the thing didn't come back. The Fantastic Four are lame, and that doesn't upset Johnny. But then Peter says something really mean. He says, he says something like, I'm glad your sister had, you know, lost the kid or something like that. It's something really, really mean. It was not inspired by the suit. It was Peter trying to say something that was so awful that it would make the Human Torch mad, which would break the hyp hypnosis he was under. And it did, obviously it worked, because it's a horrible thing to say to someone. And I thought way out of character for Peter Parker. So that's why I thought maybe the suit made him do, do it, but I guess not. So, uh, so you know, he turns and, you know, punches Peter, <laughs> obviously, but then he snapped out of it. And Peter's like, look, I didn't mean that. I'm so sorry. He's like, I just, I'm just trying to wake you up. And he's like, well, yeah, you did, but God, what a horrible thing to say to me, which was, it was a horrible thing. Uh, so, so that's why Human Torch is here with Mr. Fantastic trying to help Spider-Man because they realize the suit is alive. And I think that's really cool. My friend Nate was telling me about this the other day. He's like, I love the black uh, costume saga, the alien costume saga, because that was the cool twist on it was that Peter Parker had this new costume for, you know, months. And then he realizes it's alive. And that's this point in the story where, uh, you know, he finds out, holy crap, this suit is actually alive. So he separates from it. He tells Mr. Fantastic, get it off me, get it off me. So they shoot sonic waves at it. And that's where we find out that sound is, you know, disrupts it and fire disrupts it because Johnny Storm is there, makes a circle of fire around Peter and they separate the suit from Peter Parker and, you know, put it in a, like a cylinder, you know, to trap it. And then Spider-Man's like, oh my God. He's like, well, he's like holding his face. He's like, no, don't, you know, don't look. And I think Johnny knows who he is at this point. So they're like, it's okay, Spider-Man, you're okay, you're fine. And Spider-Man's like, oh my God, I can't believe that. This whole time that thing was alive. It was taking, taking me out for joy rides at night. That's why I'm so tired. He's like, oh my God. He's like, thank you for helping me so much. He goes, but I can't go home like this. You know, do you have, I don't know why he didn't just ask Johnny for spare clothes and just walk home as Peter Parker. But he's like, I need to get home fast. Or I need to go check on Aunt May. Something urgent was popped up. So he's like, I need a costume. So they gave him an old Fantastic Four costume and they put a bag 
go over his head. So this is where we get the amazing baghead man. <laughs> so yeah, a lot of, like I said, a lot of big, uh, you know, fun things happen in this run um, and iconic things I feel uh, happen in this run. And then, so this book ends with the suit, uh, you know, in the cylinder pissed off that, that it was separated from Peter because it thought it had a good thing going with Peter. And clearly Peter didn't feel that way. So this is where rejection and the feeling of rejection and isolation come from because now it's back in a jar like it was on Battleworld and Peter and his friends were the ones that put it there. And that's why it starts building a hatred towards Peter. So uh, so I love that. So that's where this first book ends. Um, and then there's a bunch of cool artwork in the back because some of these stories were reprinted in the 90s when they did Marvel Tales. So I'll flash a bunch of those covers up there so you can see those covers um, because I thought they were really great. And the, the artwork, I think, of some of it's by Ron Lim is beautiful. It's really, really nice artwork uh, with the suit and everything like that. And the Rose, who you know appeared in the book as well. Um, and then some of the team-ups. And then you have the first version of this in trade paperback, which has that pink cover. It says the uh, Alien Costume Saga. You had that one, and then you had the big magazine thing. So I'll have all those covers up there, which are really, really neat. So that was volume one. <laughs> That's just volume one of this. But before I get into volume two, I do want to talk about uh, the Peter David stuff and just touch on some of the stuff that takes place technically between this volume and the next volume of the Alien Costume Saga. All right, so as you guys, currently in the comic books, Peter David for the last couple years has been writing miniseries that take place during the Alien Costume Saga. He's going back and actually filling in some of the gaps of things, but also adding some stories because if you look at this, I mean, it's like a good 25, 30 issues of the Black Costume Saga. And half of it, I mean, most of Volume 2 doesn't even have the Black Costume in it on Peter. It's Peter wearing the cloth one that Black Cat made him or wearing his regular red and blue costume. And the actual alien costume is stuck in that cylinder until towards the end of Volume 2. So there is a whole bunch of time there, like about two or three months in the comics, where Peter didn't even have the suit, and it doesn't even come back to him until Web of Spider-Man number one when that launches. So there is room to add stories. So before the suit gets separated from Peter, like we just talked about, these stories take place. You have the Symbiote Spider-Man miniseries, which we already discussed on the channel, and I'll put a link to that down below, and that's like a Mysterio story, where Mysterio kind of learns the suit is alive before, before Peter does. So that's a really great story that's out there. There's also the Absolute Carnage Symbiote Spider-Man one-shot, and that one took place, you know, you kind of see through the eyes of a reporter that actually wore the black costume. There was a, there's a time coming up where when the black costume escapes from the Fantastic Four building, it bonds to a New Yorker, a, a guy who's walking around New York, and it turns out that guy's not really a New Yorker. He just moved to New York, uh, so he's brand new. He just got off the bus, and the suit bonds with him and takes him for, you know, around looking for Peter Parker's apartment, um, which is pretty neat. So that happens. That actually happened in the Black Costume Saga in part two that we're going to talk about here shortly. But in this part, the, this is like a single issue that takes place during that time where the guy had the suit uh, and, and how Carnage is now coming back to him because he has a piece of codex in him. And I just thought that was crazy that they actually referenced this guy because obviously Ben Riley had bonded with Carnage at one point, but yet he was not ever addressed in the, uh, you know, the Absolute Carnage or the King in Black storyline. They never even mentioned Ben Riley, And I'm like, but he actually bonded to Carnage for a while. So he should have a codex in him. Even if he is cloned, that codex should still be there if it's a perfect clone, which they claim he is. So I just, I thought that was weird that they would reference this guy, <laughs> then not, not Ben Riley. Um, so we have, we had that one shot. We had the, the main miniseries. But then we've also had other stuff. We've had the Alien uh, Alien Reality miniseries, which we have not discussed, so we will break that down in an ep episode coming up for sure. Um, and that's a really neat one. I think Nightmare is a part of that storyline and Doctor Strange. So that's going to be a really fun one and Hobgoblin as well. Then we also have the King in Black miniseries, which uh, is the Symbiote Spider-Man one. So this takes place in the past, but it, w it does link to King in Black, and we haven't discussed it yet. But it deals with an old Captain Marvel villain, like this uh, creepy, you know, space shadowy creature. Um, he, uh, Mr. E, I think is his name, or something along those lines. He shows up again, and it turns out he made a deal with Null, and he's like a shadow creature, and his race are somehow connected to Null. So, uh, so that's pretty neat. So we are going to talk about that. We'll do a whole episode about the King and Black series and that Captain Marvel issue that's, that introduces that character. We'll discuss all of that coming up in a single episode for sure. And then lastly, the new one that's coming out right now that they're not done with as of recording this episode, but they will be done with soon in the next month or two, which is uh, Symbiote Spider-Man Crossroads. 
And Symbiote Spider-Man Crossroads is basically Peter David around this time in the comics. He was writing the Hulk book. But before the Hulk book starts, there was a story there that he's wanted to tell, I guess, and used the Symbiote Spider-Man story to do it. So this Symbiote Spider-Man Crossroads story, we have the Hulk and we have the Eternals that are going to show up and Spider-Man dealing with those characters while in the black suit. So again, all these stories here, I wanted to make a separate segment for because they take place, um, you know, right before Spider-Man gets the costume separated from him. So, uh, so puts it perfectly kind of between these two trade paperbacks. Kind of. It fits pretty good here. So if you're reading these in order, or in this order, I would say do volume one of the Alien Costume Trade, then do all the Peter David stuff, because it takes place around that time, and then read volume two, which we'll get to here in a second. Uh, but yeah, these are really great. There are a lot of awesome books. Uh, Peter David, Greg Land are crushing it on these, and I'm not really a big fan of Greg Land's art or how he does his art with the style he uses, um, but it's effective enough, and these stories are written so well by Peter David, I really love them. So I will break them down in detail in future episodes for sure. Also, I want to take this minute before we get into volume two to talk about two other comic books that deal with the suit. So let's say this is a drifting continuity story, right? Like maybe, I guess both of them are. So the first one came out in like a, a like a little digest size book that had Thor on the cover uh, wearing the, uh, the symbiote. So let's say this is when the symbiote has been captured and for maybe a day it breaks out and it bonds to some of the Avengers. Again, this isn't really canon or really continuity, but this was just a fun little short story I read in one of these books that we never really covered on the show here. So I thought I'd squeeze it in here because it's just kind of mindless fun where the suit gets out, like there's a janitor, like, you know, mopping around it and, you know, it actually bumps into the case or cylinder. It gets out and it bonds with Doctor Strange. It bonds with, uh, you know, Captain America, I think at one point, and then also Thor and the Avengers have to take it down. But what ends up happening is the way they defeat it is through communication, uh, which I thought was cool because like that movie uh, Arrival, where the whole movie was about communicating with the alien, um, I thought that was neat. So in this one, Captain America's like, no, stop fighting it. It's bonded to Thor anyway, so we, who knows if we'll beat it. Let's try to communicate with it. So he talks it down and gets it to separate from Thor. And then Doctor Strange offers to help it in some way. So uh, at the end, uh, so, so instead of locking it back up. So again, this is not really canon, but it was just a fun little story that I thought I'd mention. And so there's the issue that it appears in and the writing team and art team on it. Um, but it's just a little short story in this little digest trade that came out a couple years ago. And I was looking for a place to put it. So I decided to include it here. And then the next one that we're going to talk about is, an, again, a drift in continuity. It was continuity at the time, because at this time in the comic books, Marvel actually owned uh, the comic book rights, I guess, uh, and production rights for Transformers. So Transformers is a Hasbro license, obviously, from Takara Tomy from Japan. But uh, Marvel had the chance to create, like Bud Budiaski, who was working at Marvel at the time, he was given the task to name the Transformers. Because over in, uh, you know, in Japan with Takara Tomy, they had different names, the Transformers. They weren't Optimus Prime or Megatron. But so Bud Budiaski actually got the job to name them and come up with a backstory about Cybertron and all that. So he worked on stuff with his editors at Marvel to create the actual storyline of Transformers. So Marvel put out a four-issue miniseries of Transformers. And issue three, they wanted to make sure sales were up on it. So they wanted to use Spider-Man. But they couldn't because Hasbro didn't have the rights to Spider-Man. Uh, Kenner did for the toys. So Kenner was like, no way. You cannot put Spider-Man in a comic book with the Transformers because they're Hasbro and we can't have our toy in a same comic as their toy. Funny thing is Hasbro now owns all the Marvel characters to make toys of, uh, has a license for it. Actually, they don't own it, but they have the license to make uh, Spider-Man toys now. So I think it's kind of funny, but at that time Kenner did. So Kenner's like, you cannot do it. So, so Marvel was like, all right, fine. So then they found a loophole. Spider-Man was now in the black costume and Kenner did not own the licensing rights for the black costume. So they said, oh, actually, we can put Spider-Man in. We found a gray area because he's in a black costume now. So Spider-Man actually does show up in a black costume in a, a Transformers issue three. So you get interactions between Spider-Man and Optimus Prime and all these great characters. 
So for me, this is like a cloud nine moment. I love this issue so much. I love this little story. I have some toys hopefully up on screen there of those characters of G1 versions of them. The re the re-release versions, not the originals, unfortunately. Um, and then my Spider-Man uh, three three quarter inch figure that just came out recently, which is kind of like a Kenner version of Spider-Man. So I just thought it was funny. And now I have a video here where a Kenner type, even though it's made by Hasbro, uh, uh, Spider-Man toys there with a Hasbro toys uh, reissues. So yes, trying to bring it all full circle and make it meta and weird. So there you go. Hopefully you enjoyed that. And uh, I, I like this issue. The only way to find it though is in the Transformers, I think classics volume one. It doesn't say that issue three. Like when I looked at the solicits, it, it says this trade collects issues one through two and four through 10. And I'm like, wait a minute, they skipped issue three. That's the one with Spider-Man in it. So I bought it on a whim anyway, hoping it would still be in there. And it was. So it actually has issues 1 through 10 in that trade. So if you see that trade out there, there's the cover. Pick that up. That will have this story with Spider-Man and the Transformers in it. But it's really good. It's a really solid issue. And I wanted to mention it here because I guess technically it's continuity. But since the Transformers aren't in the Marvel Universe anymore, they're part of IDW, I guess it's not continuity. So we'll consider it a drifting continuity because it, it meant something then. And it still, to me, means something now. <laughs> Next up, we have the second volume of the Alien Costume Saga. So I have the cover up there so you can go find it online or on Comixology, wherever you want to buy your comics. Um, but yes, pick it up. It's really, really good. This one, though, I will say, not a lot of black costume in it. It starts off with a Spider-Man team up with Nomad, and he is wearing the black costume. So I guess this technically takes place before he got separated from the suit. Uh, but this is a really great story, this Nomad story. And then there's like an uh, Amazing Spider-Man issue in here uh, that's post the, the suit getting taken away. He's dealing with the Hobgoblin and he realizes, okay, this guy is a problem. So I'm putting on my red and blue pajamas again and I'm going to go out and try to stop him. So over the next few issues, we have the answer come back. We have the cloak and dagger stuff. We have the spot getting introduced. We have Silvermane uh, being resurrected by the Kingpin. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on and Cloak actually delivers Silvermane to Kingpin to try to take down Kingpin so he can distract him enough to go save Dagger. So I thought that was pretty cool um, to, to use uh, Silvermane in that way. But Silvermane's back with the, you know, he died as an old man, but he's back, you know, hooked up to the robotic body and stuff. So, um, so there's really neat stuff. There's also an issue where Spider-Man uh, meets the Hermit in an issue of Peter Parker Spider-Man. And it's basically this guy who is a hermit. He doesn't like to go outside. And then when he does, he gets uh, pulled into this like uh, criminal empire thing where he ends up trying to go rob a bank and stuff. And then, and Spider-Man gives him some advice at the end. And then the guy says, you know what, I will do that. And so he goes off and just becomes a face in the crowd. And it just is a hermit, <laughs> you know? So I thought that was kind of neat. It was just a really cool issue. And this trade also features the Spider-Man and Human Torch team up that I mentioned earlier, where Spider-Man says those hor that horrible thing to Human Torch to break him out of that spell. Um, but in this, you start seeing the the costume. So this is the issue where they start, at least for one page in uh, some of these issues, they cut to the costume at the Fantastic Four Baxter building, still in that cylinder, trying to figure out ways to escape. And it, it's hatred building towards Spider-Man. Um, so that this is where that starts setting up. And then you have Spider-Man teaming up with Thor. So that's a really fun one because Thor actually throws his hammer and Spider-Man webs it and gets yanked, you know, to go and like hit some villain with it. So, uh, so really cool stuff. I mean, just like some of those moments where I think we've seen in Endgame where they did that, where the hammer went and, uh, and Spider-Man webbed to it and, and got pulled away. So, uh, so yeah, just a lot of neat stuff. The Scorpion shows up in this uh, issue um, and fights, uh, fights Spider-Man uh, in one of the um, annuals. I think Amazing Spider-Man annual. So all these are really great stories, but not a lot of them deal with the black costume. Like I said, the black costume is mainly in this. Either it's Spider-Man in a cloth costume or it's the black costume in the cylinders trying to figure a way to break out of the Baxter building. And that's really all we get uh, in most of this. Uh, J. Jonah Jameson is getting remarried in this one and he's having like some drama between him and his son, John, who's like not sure about his dad getting remarried, you know, because he thinks it's a betrayal to their, the memory of their mother, his mother or whatever. So I thought that that was really well done. And then at the end, John gives his blessing. So that was a really cool issue, really good annual there with Scorpion. And Scorpion, of course, showing up, try to take his revenge on uh, J. Jonah Jameson because he's the one who kind of helped, you know, get, scorpion made he wanted to make his own super costume person and fund it to take down spider-man because he thought spider-man was a criminal and he ends up help creating a criminal definitely one of the biggest stains on uh j jonah jameson's record for sure so i like that this issue this marriage issue dealt with that like dealt with the scorpion coming back in um and then of course big arcs with the uh in amazing spider-man with the hobgoblin and spider-man dealing with them they had these really great covers really great stuff but the hobgoblin story arc with harry uh, trying to figure out who stole his dad's equipment, all that 
was really well done. And it's during this story where the black costume actually escapes. This little robot thing from the Baxter building that Reed Richards invented is going around and it accidentally cracks the case, the cylinder that the symbiote is in and the symbiote slithers out and is free and now goes out into the streets of New York to find that uh, guy who got off the bus and bond with him and and take him around looking for Peter Parker's apartment. So uh, so that's all happening in the background while Peter Parker is fighting the spot and trying to uh, you know take you know take down the kingpin and and all that and and warn kingpin to leave Black Cat alone. And then also he's teaming up with Cannonball. So that was a really fun issue because you don't really see a lot of cool Cannonball solo ish you know stories and stuff. Uh, but I like that character a lot. So and then after the Cannonball team up, you get the final issue of Marvel team up which is Spider-Man and the X-Men. And the X-Men at that time was Colossus and Rogue, Nightcrawler, and Rachel Gray um, from the future, you know, the, the daughter of uh, Scott Summers and Jean Gray. And, uh, and this is a really great issue because it features the Juggernaut, which is an a, a, a old foe of Spider-Man as well. He's an X-Men foe for sure, but he also fought Spider-Man a lot back in the day. And so this one is the Juggernaut showing up with the gem of Sidorak, uh, of the Sidorak gem, and he's giving it to Black Tom, his best friend, and turning Black Tom on his birthday into a Juggernaut. So now you got two Juggernauts. You have a Black Tom Cassidy Juggernaut, and you have Juggernaut. And they're running around causing, you know, havoc on Black Tom's birthday, and Spider-Man and the X-Men have to team up to fight them. So you get some cool fights between Spider-Man and uh, Juggernaut, and Colossus and Juggernaut Nightcrawler helping out. It's really, really well done. It's a fantastic issue, and it ends that amazing series, which Marvel Team Up and Marvel 2-in-1 were some amazing stuff. That's why I liked Marvel Comics Presents so much, because to me that was my generation's version of those two types of comics, uh, and it's just so well done. It's it's a really great issue. Um, and then you have another amazing Spider-Man issue here where Spider-Man is wearing the, the cloth black suit uh, that Black Cat made him, and he finds out there's this other kid running around as... Uh, dressed in a Spider-Man costume, and he's got Dr. Octopus arms. And it turns out this is a kid who's just, his name is Ollie Osnick. We actually did an episode on him uh, way back when in the Thunderbolts, when Matt Gargan was uh, the, the Venom character. Uh, we had uh, Ollie Osnick show up in an issue, and he's older, and he got ripped, and he's like in shape. And he's like, no, like Spider-Man revealed his identity, but I'm going to go out there and be the new Spider-Man. So I'm going to wear the costume. Uh, but I think he wore like a version of the black costumes, which is cool. And then he had the octopus arms and he goes out there trying to save the day. And the Thunderbolts show up and beat the living crap out of him. And I think Venom eats his arm off or something like it's like one of his actual human arms. Um, so Ollie Osnick, this is where we get that character uh, in his first appearance. And he's like trying to help, uh, you know, stop a bully uh, at a school, I guess, and uh, ends up getting a girl that uh, that, you know, he liked to kind of show some interest in him at the end of the story. So I thought that was cool. It's a really just fun little issue um, followed up quickly by the conclusion of the spot storyline and then leading right into Web of Spider-Man number one, which is where this trade pretty much ends. Uh, this trade paperback has a lot in it, just like the first one. But this is the story where like these uh, centurions or vulture type guys show up. There's like a group of them and they're going to rob a bank. And Spider-Man says and talk to Aunt May at this point. So that drama is still going on. So Mary Jane goes and talks to Aunt May and tries to say, hey, maybe we can together go see Peter or something like that. So they're that's working in the background and that does pay off in a future issue later on. Um, but in that, so that, but that doesn't get wrapped up here in this trade. What does get wrapped up here is Spider-Man fighting those centurion guys, fighting the vulture guys, and then uh, ending up on a church roof. Uh, after the suit has bonded with him and realizing like waking up and going oh my god the suit is back it switched you know because he had the black uh, costume the stitched one that uh, the black cat made him he had that in his closet along with the red and blue one and he went to grab the black one for you know a mission like he wants sometimes he's like oh maybe i'll still do stealth missions in this costume so he goes to grab it and uh, it's actually the real living symbiote it found its way you know being attached to that guy uh, off the bus and everything, found its way back to Peter's apartment, went upstairs and switched places with the um, cloth suit. And so when Peter puts it on, he doesn't realize he has the symbiote on him. So it reveals itself that it's on him and it's like, you know, fighting back against them. And they end up tumbling into uh, onto a church like because they're fighting in the air against the vulture guys. And he tumbles onto the, the church bell near the church bells and the bells are going off and they separate the, you know, the suit separates from Peter at this point. But as a last act of kindness, uh, which we've talked about before on the show. Um, we talked about this issue before, so that's why I'm not going into too much detail. Uh, the suit does save Peter Parker. The bells are literally rocking Peter's brain and hurting him. And so the suit does pull him far enough away from the, the sound to where it doesn't hurt him as much. 
and then kind of disintegrates into the floor and disappears. And we know it goes down into the church and coincidentally down there, Eddie Brock is there praying, you know, uh, you know, for, for some kind of message from God, I guess, cause he, you know, he's very religious and he's, uh, and he, you know, in the movie, he wants Peter Parker and Spider-Man dead. But in this, I think he's just going there, you know, asking for guidance, you know, and what he gets is an alien costume. So the Lord works in mysterious ways, right? So uh, that's where this book ends. And so again, you get more reprint covers from Marvel Tales of some of these great issues. So I'll put some of those covers up there. Um, and this is just, it's really well done. I mean, I thought this was fun. I, I just was surprised that it didn't get into the aggression part of things. And that's where the next ch uh, section of this episode is going to, we're going to go into is the animated version. But before we get there, let those covers up there play and uh, and just say my final thoughts on this word that it did surprise me. I was surprised the suit. All it really did was take Spider-Man for joy rides, but that did have effects on Peter Parker's life because he was so tired. So overall though, uh, even though I was surprised by that, I still liked how a lot of this handled some continuity issues, some some things in here that aren't really well done, but the team ups were really great. I love seeing Spider-Man with other characters and bouncing off other characters that have different personalities in them, like like Cannonball, for example, or someone who's sometimes as immature as him, like Human Torch. Like, I, I liked that. I thought that was fun. And even though I don't say Spider-Man's immature all the time, he's definitely a guy who's about responsibility. But uh, but at times he can be kind of a kid, too. And I liked, you know, seeing him and Human Torch team up. That's always fun. Uh, but seeing Spider-Man team up with, like, a womanizer like Star Fox, but then also teaming up with Monica Rambeau, who's very headstrong and very, you know, a uh, very powerful person but isn't in control of her powers. All these things, all these team-ups, the X-Men, like, all that stuff was some of my favorite. But also the, the actual character drama with Peter Parker and his loved ones I thought was really well done, even though they weren't mostly affected... Uh, becoming, you know, coming from the suit and its effect on Peter, except for the tiredness and that affected his job at the Bugle. But his actual relationship with Mary Jane and uh, Black Cat and Aunt May, those were already there. Uh, and he was just dealing with that. And I thought those were all some of the best stuff of these issues, in my opinion. <laughs> So like I said, let's just briefly talk about the Spider-Man Adventures. There was three issues where they did their version of the Black Costume Saga, adapting the, you know, the actual episodes from the cartoon series. So these are pretty much identical to that, so I won't go into too much detail. But what I'll say is this is, when I think of the Alien Costume Saga, I guess I really do think about this more than the original. And that's kudos to the people who wrote these episodes of the show and translated to the comics, which I think were some of the same people, actually. Because this, when I think of the Alien Costume Saga, I don't think about Secret Wars. I think about John Jameson finding it on an asteroid and bringing it back to Earth. And they called it Prometheum X or whatever. And Alistair Smythe and the Kingpin, you know, got their hands on it. And then Spider-Man, uh, Sp you know, uh, Spider-Man shows up and takes it, right? Like, I think uh, it ends up in the hands of Rhino. He goes to steal it from the ship as it crash lands. And, and to bring it to, uh, to you know, King, Kingpin and stuff. And the suit at that point leaves uh, the rock and bonds with Spider-Man in the Hudson when he gets hit by the rhino and falls into the Hudson River. And so when, uh, you know, when the rock, the Promethean X is brought back to the Kingpin and Smythe by the rhino, they analyze it and, and say, oh, it has all these abilities. It can be used like an atom bomb. Holy crap. But then uh, Spider-Man wearing the black suit goes and takes it back from them so he can study it. And then it turns out the rock, after being in Earth's atmosphere for a certain amount of time, its power or whatever its effects are, the chemicals change in it, and it's no longer can be used for an atom bomb. So if you go and get a piece of this, you need to use it to destroy a city like right away if you're a villain, or you need to use its powers right away, because within 24 hours, it the rock becomes just a rock. So I thought that was just cool, just a neat thing. But this has like the version of the Spider-Man Nightmare where the suit in the... The two suits are fighting over Peter. They do a version of that here, which is from the comics and from the animated show, obviously. Um, and then spe uh, in this, you see Peter's aggression level rise. He snaps at Flash Thompson, just like he did in the cartoon. He's, you know, back talks Aunt May. He back talks Mary Jane. I mean, all these things that are from uh, the cartoon are here. Uh, and But that's what I'm saying. It's, it's so effective. So everything I thought of that was going to happen in the cartoon, I'm like, oh, this all happened in the cartoon. When I was reading the actual trades of the comics... I'm like, wait, this didn't happen. This didn't happen. John Jameson's here, but he's only here arguing with his dad about getting remarried. He he didn't bring the it, he didn't bring Prometheus X uh, Prometheus X to Earth. Uh, it came from you know Battle World and stuff. So it's just funny. Like I the the this version is done so well, 
that uh that it's i don't know it just it sticks in more than the other stuff i mean sometimes i do remember that okay the suit did come from battle world um but uh but i really definitively kind of lean on this story so these three issues are really good they retell the whole story they even tell the story of the suit leaving peter in the church and bonding to eddie brock and turning him into venom and the whole last issue is him fighting venom which is you know true to the last episode of the the cartoon as well and he much like the Venom movie, it ends with uh, Spider-Man and Venom, uh, or in the case of the Venom movie, Venom and Riot, fighting outside of a giant rocket ship. And, uh, and, what, and the, you know, Venom wants to take the rocket ship away or, you know, like leave what, on it and stuff. And Spider-Man beats him up. Uh, or no, Spider-Man leads him there, I think. I don't think Venom wants to leave. Uh, he just wants to kill Spider-Man. So Spider-Man leads him there, separates the suit because the sound and the fire of the, the shuttle taking off disrupts the suit. Spider-Man webs it up and webs it to the side of the, the shuttle, and it goes off back into space, and he saves Eddie Brock. But I like this. I thought this was fun revisiting, because I was like, yeah, this was all the stuff I was looking for. I was looking for, you know, Peter Parker, like, you know, back-talking Aunt May, and yelling at Flash Thompson, and standing up to him, finally, and getting a backbone, and I was looking for all that in, in the main comic, and I didn't really get any of that. So just just fun stuff, fun to revisit all this. I, I really do love this era of Spider-Man, and I'm glad I finally got to talk about it with all of you and condense it all in this one episode, but we're not done yet. We have one more thing we gotta discuss. So like I said, there is a cloth version of the black costume. So after Spider-Man's time in, in the alien costume and fighting Venom after all these years, there were times in the comic where Spider-Man has gone back and worn the black suit. Sometimes for no real reason, like other than Mc, Todd McFarlane just wanted to draw it. So there is a two-part um, comic book called Sub City that McFarlane drew. And I think it was like issue 11 and 12 or 12 and 13 of his ongoing Spider-Man book right before he left the book to create Spawn. So this was the early 90s. And there's a story with Morbius underground in the sewers of New York and Spider-Man fights him and he goes under the, in the sewers wearing the black costume to fight Morbius. So he's just wearing a cloth suit. It's not the actual alien, but I think it was just McFarlane wanting to revisit that suit because he's kind of the co-creator in a way of Venom. And I don't think he ever got to draw a full-on Spider-Man in the black suit other than that battle that he had with Venom in that issue in Amazing Spider-Man 300. So he wanted to kind of revisit that and draw that suit as his goodbye to Spider-Man in a way. Even though I think he drew one more issue of Spider-Man after that, but this was like his last kind of story himself. So uh, so I like that. It was cool to see the suit again, even if it didn't make a lot of sense <laughs> to have it there um, because it scares the living crap out of Mary Jane. She does not like the black suit because of the, you know, because Venom terrorized her at one point. Uh, but there is a point later on in the comics called Back in Black, which they released also in two big trade paperbacks, where this was after Spider-Man revealed his identity to the world during Civil War, and before he does the One More Day thing, where he makes a deal with him and Mary Jane with Mephisto to undo their marriage and everything and undo everyone's memory that Peter Parker is Spider-Man. So this takes place between those events, and in this, it's Peter wearing the black suit again because once he revealed himself to be, uh, you know, Peter Parker, Spider-Man, then the Kingpin hired a, a, an assassin to try to kill Peter, and Peter's spider sense warned him of danger, and he moved out of the way, and the bullet went by Peter and hit Mary, uh, hit Aunt May, and um, nearly killing her. So she's in the hospital on life support at this point in the comics, and Peter can't even go visit her because he's now wanted, um, because his identity has been revealed. Superheroes have been turned against because of Norman Osborn taking over as the Dark Avengers and stuff, so Peter couldn't really go and be with Aunt May at this point. Uh, so Mary Jane could, but but Peter couldn't. But they even still, there there were still villains looking for them. So even Mary Jane wasn't safe. So they had to like bring her into a hospital as like a Jane Doe and try to get them to not ever release her information. So there was really good storyline, but Peter wears the black suit again and he's basically going to get revenge on Kingpin for hiring that assassin. So it's, it's well done overall. There's some neat story beats in this. There's one story that I like that most people don't, where Peter Parker goes and talks talks to God, uh, which is neat. Uh, or God just shows up and starts talking to Peter. Um, but that's also because right after that, Peter makes a deal with the devil. Uh, and I think this is God trying to warn him that something bad was coming. So, uh, But all that's been retconned now, kind of, by Nick Spencer. So we don't need to get into that. But if you do want more Spider-Man in the black suit, there are stories like that, the back in black. He's not wearing the alien costume, but he's wearing a cloth one. So you can definitely check that out if you want more Spider-Man in black costume. Even if you don't care, it's a symbiote. If you just like the look, those trades are out there as well. And is that McFarlane two-part story. This is amazing. We're four 
four years doing this show. We hit 700 episodes in four years. Um, four years and three days. I guess I could cheat a little bit, uh, but I'll just say four years. It's easier that way. And, um, and also 2,800 subscribers. When we started the show, we had about 500 and something subscribers. So I just want to thank you all, the you know, 2,000 plus new people that came here, the people that have been here before and watched my you know previous stuff that I used to make on this channel and stuck around. Like, thank you all so much for being here. Thanks for celebrating 700 episodes with me and talking about probably the most pivotal part of this whole character of Venom, which is the beginning, the origins of the black suit coming to Earth and on the back of Spider-Man. Um, I think this was really fun to examine and do it all in one episode. I hope you enjoyed yourselves. And if you did or didn't, whatever the case may be, like, dislike, but comment down below. Let me know your thoughts. I'd love to hear them. And we'll continue the conversation as always down there. Thanks so much for watching the show. Like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. And in the next episode, I will have my Morbius trailer review go up or reaction because I actually filmed that before filming this. Uh, and I didn't want to release that as episode 700 because you all voted for this episode. So I'll get this up. And then soon after, with hopefully within 24 hours, you'll have that Morbius trailer reaction as well. And then we'll get into the Mike Costa stuff. And, uh, and then we'll talk about other Venom things very, very soon. And Black Costume Spider-Man stuff very soon as well. Thanks so much. See you in the future. Peace.